Um, and so we're going to look at Acts chapter 17 and verse 28. If y'all can on your own when you're home to this afternoon, sometime this week, read Acts chapter 17 verses 22 through 28 to frame and to help you understand the context of this verse. But 28 says, for in him we live and move and have our being. In him we move and live Excuse me, in him we live and move and have our being. And then, if you will, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I've prayed, so I believe God is going to begin moving even now as we read his word. I want to read verses 5 through 12. And this is where we'll focus our attention on this morning. From the New King James Version, it reads, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine in our hearts out of our, excuse me, out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let me read that again. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I thought that there were some believers in the room who would be shouting with me right there just by the preach, just by the uh, reading of the word. We are always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus who may be manifested in our mortal may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Verse 7 again, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. I would like to title our sermon from this passage this morning. I would like to title it A Treasure Box. As we explore the question, who are you? I want to let you know that you are a treasure box. Pastor T, she began last week in this pathway of investigating who are we. Last week, she masterfully led us to see how we are God's beloved. And knowing that we are God's beloved helps us to know that, one, you are enough. You have an audience of one. And you can escape every temptation and this week if you'll pray with me I believe that we will continue to investigate and search in the scriptures and see that in this passage we find out that we are God's treasure box what's the oddest place you've hidden a treasure I know you don't want to you can't tell me because now I know where to go (laughs) I know we had some grandmothers back in the day. Some of y'all probably still do this. They would hide their money underneath the bed. (laughs) What's the oddest place you've found a treasure? In February of 2017, a worker at a recycling plant in Ontario, Canada, never expected to find what he did in an old tube TV. Some of y'all people don't even know what that is. He was disassembling this tube TV, and as he was beginning to disassemble this old TV, there was a cash box that had been hidden, stashed away, and stowed inside of this TV. When he opened the box, he discovered stacks of $50 bills, and he immediately knew it had to be a large amount of money in that cash box. And he was right. It was more than a hundred thousand dollars that was found inside that cash box inside that old useless broken worn out discarded tv hundred thousand dollars 
after tracking down the owner of it, it turned out that the TV, it had been brought to the recycling place by a man who actually had been given the TV by his friend. His friend gave him the TV 30 years prior to that. Imagine $100,000 just sitting away in a TV for over 30 years. The original owner, he had hidden the money away inside the TV, but he had forgot that he had put it there before he gave it to his friend. And the friend who finally got rid of the TV to have it recycled had no idea that his trash would turn out to be his friend's treasure. Another similar situation happened in November of 2013 when a rabbi in Connecticut bought a used desk on Craigslist for $150. After going to pick up the desk and packing it in his van, hauling it back to his house, when he got home, he wasn't able to fit the desk through the door of his study where he wanted it to go. So he began to disassemble and take apart the desk in order to get it into his study. And while he was taking it apart, wedged in between two parts of the desk was a bag full of money that fell out of the desk. He had paid $350 for the desk, and the money inside that bag ended up totaling $98,000. The rabbi, he ended up piling up his four children in his van the next day and returning the money back to the original owner. I know some of y'all are thinking, mm, I wouldn't have been me. When he gave the money back to the woman, the woman was so shocked and touched that he would return the money. She explained that the money was part of an inheritance that she had received and had misplaced. And she had stuck it in this desk, forgotten about it, misplaced it, and hidden it and a desk that was only worth $350 at the time. But was it worth $350 or was it worth $98,350? Because of the inheritance that was in it was more valuable than the container that it was in. This morning, I've come here to help you and to help myself get a clue about where we can find a priceless treasure that no one can afford. If you, like me, I'm sure I have placed faith in Jesus and you're looking for a treasure in an unexpected place, look no further than inside yourself. If you've placed faith in Jesus, this passage lets us know that we are God's treasure box because of what he has put inside of us. God has placed a treasure inside of you and of me, a treasure inside, as this passage calls it, an earthen vessel, a jar of clay, a cracked pot. He's put a treasure inside of it. I know for some of you, it may be hard to believe and imagine that God has placed anything of worth or value inside of you. You, like me, you're well aware of your deficiencies. You're well aware of your inadequacies. You're well aware of your long rap sheet of failures. You know your mistakes better than anybody else. In fact, you felt like you don't deserve for God to place anything of worth or value inside of you. You felt like trash sometimes. You felt like others have picked over you, looked over you, thrown you away, discarded you to the trash heap. You feel like you failed and you've messed up and you don't deserve God's treasure. But this passage asserts that inside of our frail, fragile, fickle, faulty, and failing frames lies a treasure that is more valuable than any of us could ever imagine. 
This passage says that we have this treasure. Do you know who is included in we? It's not just Paul who is writing this that is included in we. He is talking to Christians and he is telling all Christians who have placed faith in Jesus, we have this treasure in our earthly, fragile, fickle, faulty, failing frames. An earthen vessel back in that time was quintessentially fragile as one commentary puts it. It's, it was a vessel that was prone to breakage, easily chipped and easily cracked. It is something that is expendable, something that is often thrown away and discarded when it is cracked. It is like your piece of glassware or your cup or your mug that when it breaks, what do you do with it? You sweep it up and you throw it away. Because it's of little value. Yes, perhaps it would cost you $10, $15, $20, but really you can easily replace it. You can easily go and buy something else in replace of it. And this passage is saying that God places his treasure in that, that which is expendable, that which is cheap, that which is easily thrown away, easily replaced. Something that is prone to easily crack. Something that is prone to be broken easily. So easily that the world would throw it away. Why would God place such a valuable treasure in something so weak? I don't know about you, but that's the question I'm asking myself this morning. Why would God place his treasure inside of our earthen clay pot, cracked pots? Why would he place it in us? God could choose a whole lot of things to place his treasure in. You know that, right? God, what I could not believe is that God doesn't place his treasure in something where it stays safe. Like for us, we put our money in banks and we want to make sure that the money is secure, federally secured, right? Or we put our money in a safe where nobody can get to it so that nothing can can harm it, nothing, no fire, nothing can burn it. We, we, put our, we put our treasures into things where we want it to be kept safe so that nothing can break it. But God puts his treasure in weak things. It should let us know something about God's treasure. God's treasure is such that it does not need to be kept safe because it saves itself. This treasure that we're talking about, it is what we see in verse number six. It is what God, who commanded light to shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. It is the gospel. It is that God has come through Jesus Christ to save us. And that is the glory on the face of Jesus Christ, that God saves us. And so God puts that in us because he doesn't want to keep that safe. And guess what? He doesn't want to keep it hidden either. God places his treasure in us because he doesn't have to keep it safe. It's going to take care of itself. And he places it in earthen vessels because he doesn't want to keep it hidden. I know your treasure. You have a safety locks box. You have a secret code. You don't want anybody to have your Internet password because you don't want them to get to your treasure. Guess what? God wants people to get to his treasure. He doesn't want to keep it hidden. He doesn't want to keep it safe behind a vault. And don't we sometimes keep God's treasure hidden? 
physically keep it in the four walls of a church on Sunday morning. But God doesn't want his treasure hidden. Perhaps that's why he puts it in an earthen vessel. Because he knows if it's cracked, it'll leak out. See, he can't leave it up to us because if he leaves it up to us, we're going to try to keep that thing safe and secure and hidden. But God says, if I put it in something that's easily broken, folks won't have a choice but to see it because it'll leak out. That's not even in my notes. And, and, and that's, that's, I think that that leads us to what we see in this passage. It says, why do we have this treasure in earth and vessels? That the excellency of the power of God may be of God and not us. That the excellence, the glory, the renown of the power may be of God and not us. Y'all, the reason why God puts his power, his treasure in us is because it is through the weak vessel that the greatness of his power can be revealed. It is through the weak vessel that his power can be shown how powerful it is because when he puts it in a weak vessel, you know that the power did not come from the vessel. It had to have come from what's inside of the vessel. God puts his treasure in weak vessels because it is intended to highlight God's strength. God houses this treasure in such lowly vessels so that others may see the treasure and the power and know that God is the reason why they have power. Because when they look at your life and they see how broken it is and they see how much you have done wrong and they see how you have come short and they see your inadequacies and they see that you're just a a cracked pot, they can say, whatever is going on with them, it can't be because they have strength. They must have a source of strength beyond themselves that helps them to show forth God's glory. God does his best work through weak vessels. And he does his best work through weak vessels because when he does so, it becomes unmistakable that the power is not from the vessel, but it is from God. That is why later on Paul will say, it is when I am weak that God's strength is made most visible. God, he puts his power in us, even though we're weak, so that people will see us in our weak selves and see his power and know that any power we have, it ain't because we are strong. It's because of what God has put inside of us. Y'all, this is important for us to grasp because there are two cautions in this. The first caution is this, is that you, some people, I've been preaching, and the reason why you haven't been saying anything is because you don't think you're a weak vessel. You don't think you're a cracked vessel. You look back over your life and you say, well, I did pretty good for myself. I've arrived at what I've arrived at because I've used my intellect, I've used my connections, I've used my pedigree, I've used um, networking skills, I've used my degree, I've gone to school, I've made the right job applications, I've gotten the right resume, nicely needed. And so the reason why I am where I am is because I'm pretty good. You look at yourself in the mirror when you go out the house. I like what I see. (laughs) And this is a caution in this. Because what this passage is teaching us is that, guess what? We are all just clay pots. 
You can dress it up as much as you want to dress it up. But guess what? You a clay pot just like I'm a clay pot. And as I heard Reverend Dr. Maurice Watson say, in fact, any title that we put on our names, Pastor T, we need to put crack pot after it. So if you got a doctorate, you need to say Dr. Crack Pot. If you got a pastor, if you're a pastor, Pastor Crack Pot, Deacon Crack Pot, Usher Crack Pot, Minister Crack Pot, whatever your title is, don't forget that you are just a cracked pot. Yeah, you can dress this thing up. But there's going to come a day where your young, vibrant self ain't going to be so perky and vibrant always. You need to remember that you're just a cracked pot. As I was studying it, I came across in the commentary, someone said a rabbinic tradition makes the comparison that just as wine cannot keep well in silver or gold vessels, but only in the lowliest of vessels, earthen ones. So the words of God do not keep well in one who considers himself to be the same as silver or gold vessels. God's word only keeps well in the one who considers himself the same as the lowliest of vessels, earthen ones. See, we need to remember that any power we have Any good that we do, it is only because of God. Don't think too highly of yourself than you ought, because there has not been a man or woman of God who has done anything significant who hasn't struggled with some private or public weakness and difficulty. I'm going to say it again, even if you don't believe it, because I know it to be true. There has not been a man or woman of God who has done anything significant, who hasn't struggled with some private or public weakness or difficulty. Do you know that one of the greatest preachers they say to have lived, besides Paul and Jesus, Charles Spurgeon suffered from depression? Pastors and preachers not supposed to suffer from depression, yet they believe that he was clinically depressed. There was a time in his life where he had ministered and something bad had happened when he was ministered. I wish I had time to tell it, but I don't because I'm already 20 minutes into my message and I don't know how much time I'm going to take for the rest. But he locked himself in his room for two weeks, not coming out because he was so depressed. The elders of his church had to come and knock on his door and say, listen, you are not a failure. You may have made a mistake, but you're not a failure. Get out of there. And he is now understood to be one of the greatest preachers to ever live. Perhaps you don't like Charles Spurgeon, but I'll tell you another person. There was a guy named David in the Old Testament. David. Even before he made his mistake, he was way out in the field and nobody even thought that he was worth enough to become king. But Samuel, he was sent and he was waiting for God to pour the oil out on the anointed king and nothing was happening with the other brothers until David finally came in and the wine that everybody else had looked over had tossed aside, he was chosen to be king. Even though in the eyes of man, he was weak. Because God says, I don't look at the outward appearance. I look at what's what's in the heart. And then you do know that David did mess up. He He had a big public moral failing. And yet God still said that this is a man after my own heart. He goes on to write psalms and he goes on to write psalms and psalms after psalms because he was a man after God. And he becomes the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus, even though he had a failure. See, God, he does his best work through weak people. You could go through all of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Do you remember Elijah? Y'all remember what happened to Elijah? Elijah had this great feat where he was able to call down fire from heaven. Y'all, if I called down fire from heaven, you wouldn't be able to tell me nothing. 
And yet, right after he calls down fire from heaven, he's being chased literally for his life. And he tells God, God, would you take my life? Would you just let me die? It's too much. God does some of his best work through weak people. Do you remember Jeremiah? I'll just give you one more example. Jeremiah in the Old Testament, he, he, he was being called by God. Matter of fact, he says, he says in Jeremiah, he says, God, you, you formed me and knitted me in my mother's womb. You knew me before I was even conceived. And yet, Jeremiah was what's called the weeping prophet. Because he's like, why do I have to give this message to these people? Because God does some of his best work through weak people so that his glory would be on display. If God can use them, surely he can use you too. Here's the second caution. See, the first caution is to those who they think that they're the reason why they're righteous. And so they are self-righteous. But the second caution is to those of us who we know that we're not righteous. And so we want to throw ourselves away. Can, this is the caution. Be careful about throwing people away. I, I thank God for those three amens. Be careful about throwing people away because you never know what's inside of them. You find them in a recycling bin and you crack them open and you'll see a treasure that's invaluable inside of them. Don't throw people away and don't write people off. Don't overlook people. Don't look over people because you don't know what God has placed inside of them. And don't throw yourself away. Don't write yourself off. That's the hardest thing for me. I ain't going to write you off, but sometimes I want to write myself off. I ain't going to throw you away, but God knows sometimes I want to throw myself away because I don't think I'm worthy. I don't think I deserve any of his strength, any of his power, but don't you do it because God does some of his best work even through broken and weak people. The glory of God can still be revealed through your life. God has some glory left to shine through you too. And if you feel broken, if you feel like you've messed up, if you feel like you have failed, if you feel like you have made a mistake, I want you to remember and use the words of what David said after he messed up. In the 51st Psalm, verse 17, he says, the sacrifice that God desires is a broken spirit. It says, God will not reject a broken and repentant heart. If you feel broken, take your brokenness to God and know that God, he, is, he will not reject a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, a heart that is repentant. God will not reject that. If you feel broken, take your brokenness to God. Somebody sent me yesterday a, a clip of um, this, this guy that grew up in our area. Most of y'all not even know him. His name is Corday. He's a hip-hop artist. He said in this clip that I watched, he said, don't let your small failures make you lose sight of your bigger picture. Because God can still reveal his glory even through you. Why does God put his treasure in weak vessels because he's, he's going to show the power, the greatness of his power. That, that word power there is the word that we get the, um, it's the Greek word that we get the word dunamite from, um, um, excuse me, dynamite from. It's dunamis, and we get the word dynamite from it. It is that power that is not containable. It's the power that is 
just so huge and so large that you you can't even you can't even do anything about it. You can't harness it. You can't grasp it. And God is saying that that power is in you and it is in me if we believe in Jesus Christ. And so he puts it in weak vessels to show the greatness of his power. But he also puts it in weak vessels because it is the treasure that helps strengthen us in our weaknesses. He puts this treasure in us because he knows we're going to have weak moments. And when we're going to have weak moments, he needs us to have something that will help strengthen us to get through the weak moments. See, Paul says in this passage, beginning at verse 8, he says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not, dis- not, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. How is it that you can be hard pressed, yet not crushed? If you're hard pressed, that means you're cracking, you're about to break, you're about to fail. But this passage says, hard pressed, yet not crushed. How can you be perplexed but not be in despair? I don't know if y'all have ever had moments where your mind won't shut off. And you're perplexed, you're confused. You want to lose your mind, but you don't lose your mind. How is it that that can happen? How can you be persecuted but not be forsaken? When it seems like everybody is talking about you, everybody is making fun of you, everybody is picking on you, everybody is saying, look what they did, they are failure, but yet you're not forsaken. How can you be struck down? You get knocked out, and there's a 10 count, but on the nine, you get back up. How is that possible? Because you got a treasure in you. And it is the treasure that helps strengthen you so that you are not totally in despair. It is his treasure in you that you are not crushed. See, God has put his treasure in you, and guess what? God's going to take care of his treasure. He's going to make sure that that treasure is taken care of. See, Paul is making the argument that if such a weak, fragile, prone to brokenness vessel can endure and survive the knocks and the bangs of life against us, that the credit for how you get through that cannot be because you're durable, that it's only because of the sustaining power of God that is inside of you. That's the only explanation of why we are not destroyed with everything that we are going through. See, we go through so many situations and afflictions, and, and, they, and, and they try to stress us out. They try to break us down. They try to get us knocked down. But guess what? We have a yet not in us. We have a but not in us because we've got God's treasure in us. And somebody needs to know this morning that if you have God's treasure in you, you have a but not in you. Yep, you can be hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. You can be perplexed, but not in despair. You can be persecuted, but not forsaken. Because of God's treasure, you can be struck down, but not destroyed. And guess what? You don't just have one but not, but you got a but not after but not after but not after but not after but not inside of you. That's how good God's treasure is. That's how powerful God's treasure is. Is that when you need a but not, his treasure will strengthen you such that you can't strengthen yourself. And he'll say, yeah, you've been through, but it's not over yet. Somebody, you need to treasure the treasure that's inside of you. You don't know how you're going to make it through. You're still on the left side of the butt knot. And you haven't quite made it yet to the right side of the butt knot. But if you will treasure what's treasured inside of you, 
you'll find a day that comes along and you'll be able to look back and see the button knot is now on the left side when it was on the right side because you have made it over because you've treasured the treasure inside of you. What is the treasure inside of you? That you have been saved by grace and grace alone. You are not of yourself. It is because God has provided salvation for you through Jesus Christ that lets you know that you are beloved, that you are valued, that you only have one audience, that you are the one that you can escape anything because of what Jesus is living inside of you, what he is doing inside of you. Don't let go of that treasure. Treasure the treasure inside of you. Somebody's going to ask you, how did you, how did you survive? And you'll be saying it was Christ in me. How did you make it? I had Christ. How didn't you lose your mind? It was Christ. How come you're still here even though you should have been, you would have been, you could have been? Well, Christ in me. I um, grew up in the days where we had real cartoons, Minister Drew, my wife, my wife, she reminded me of the other day. She said, didn't you say you ate cereal and watch cartoons all day? I said, yeah, that was on Saturday mornings, though. During the week, I would watch Sports Center all day. So that was a different story. But on Saturday mornings, one of the cartoons that I loved to watch was Popeye the Sailor Man. Oh, somebody else, y'all, y'all know that one? And you know, you know what was about, what's funny about Popeye the Sailor Man is that we watched it and we loved it, but we always knew how it was going to end, right? Popeye and his girlfriend, Olive Oil, they'd be doing something just enjoying their life. And then out of nowhere, who would show up? Bluto. And, and, and then they would start fighting and Popeye would start losing. Bluto would be tearing him up punching him in his face, knocking him down, bouncing him all around, throwing him up in the air because Popeye was weak. But every time during the show, without failure, there would come a point where Popeye would reach and he would get that spinach because he knew he didn't have the strength. But if he ate that spinach that he would have the strength to fight Bluto. And what would happen every time he would find that strength, even though he had been beaten up, even though he had been knocked down, even though he had been thrown a while, even though he had afflictions and suffering, he would eat that spinach and get the strength. You need to know you got spinach too. You got spinach too. You... Can know how this chapter is going to end. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us and gives us strength. You know how it's going to end. Treasure the treasure that's inside of you. I wish I had more time, but I got to go on. Where am I? Sometimes when we have these treasures inside of us, when we're hard-pressed yet not crushed, meaning we're fragile and we're, we're breaking, we're, we're prone to brokenness, we're being smashed in, and, and, and we know we got cracks, we know we got leaks. Sometimes what's hard is is bearing through that brokenness. Paul moves on to this next part that tells us why, why God puts this treasure in weak vessels. Because of, there's something that God does in and through our brokenness. He says in verse number 10 that we are always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That's why I read from the New King James Version this morning, because they, yeah. they translate this word correctly, dying. It, it, is, it is not the death. It is not something that is final. We do believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it is the, the dying of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That Jesus suffered even before the cross. That he was always on the run. I was reading uh, 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 Pastor T um, after Jesus. Um, I was reading passages before because when you preached last week, I like to read the context around it. Jesus, um, they, he, he had announced who he was. That um, Isaiah, um, In Isaiah, he says, this, I, I've come to fulfill this prophecy today. And they try to kill him right then and there. But he escapes. He was suffering all along. So he was, he was dying, he was suffering all along. And so Paul says we are carrying around in the body this dying. It, he uses a different word than the normal word that's used for death or dying. He, he doesn't use the word of something final. He uses the word that really gives the picture of something decaying or decomposing. Because sometimes when you're going through stuff, your brokenness feels that way. And he's saying we carry this around in us, Christ dying in us, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Y'all got to be patient with me just for a few minutes because this one is hard to explain, but I'm going to try to do the best I can and try to not do it and and take too long to do it. But, But really what he's saying is the reason why God puts his treasure in weak vessels is because God can use broken vessels. See, the first one was that God can reveal his glory, his strength through broken vessels. But the last one is, is that God can use our broken vessels. Although the container seems to be dying and leaking and is not sufficient, it's inefficient because it's leaking everywhere, this is letting us know that God puts his glory in our, these earthen vessels because while we are leaking out, it can produce life around us. God can use you even if you're broken and cracked. He can use you to leak out the life of his gospel so that people and communities and culture will flourish around you because you leak out his gospel through your cracks and your brokenness. Some people are broken, and you don't even know they're broken, and they are ministering to you, and God is using his life to leak out on you through them such that you flourish and have life and health. I know two people in this room who ministered through brokenness, that they literally had to minister while they were feeling broken themselves. Because God can use you even when you're broken. And I want somebody to get that. Because you need to know that God can use you even in your brokenness. And oftentimes, you don't even know someone is broken. In this case, they they looked at Paul, and Paul did not... He did not, he not, he didn't look calmly. He, they said he was probably short. Um, he probably wasn't good looking. Um, they said he may have had a speech impediment. They, like, like they looked at Paul and they would say, God is definitely using you through your brokenness. But some of us, you'll never know that we're broken. You'll never know what we have gone through. You'll never know that at night we can't sleep. But God is still using. And you need to know that God can do that in your life. See, many of us, we wait for everything to be mended before we'll give God our vessel to be used. And God is saying, no, I use broken vessels. 
when you're wondering whether or not God can use a broken vessel like yourself, as difficult as it may feel to accept, know that he can use you simply because of what he put inside of you. Your quest must be, Lord, how will you use me even though I'm broken? Somebody needs to write that down. Your quest needs to be, God, how will you use me even though I'm broken? Because what this passage helps us to see that is if we look at God through the grand narrative of redemptive history in Scripture, we will see that God has used broken people over and over again. He even uses Paul. Weak vessels over and over again. And so as we look back on that redemptive narrative, we need to know that God has us a part of that narrative as well. And so what he did for them, he is still trying to continue to do through me and you right now. I heard, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I'm done after this, I promise. I, I heard it best explained through an illustration. A friend of, uh, a friend of mine, he I don't know whether or not the illustration is true, but <laughs> I think it's true. They, they, they said that they grew up in an urban neighborhood, and they had a grandmother that was from the south. And so the grandmother knew how to um, plant um, food, um, food um, um, vegetables and fruit and stuff like that. And um, I have no idea. You put me on a farm, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, so I'm kind of like him. But um, he said he had a grandmother that came from the south and, and did that. And so his grandmother um, would take him out um, in the summertime sometimes, and they would... Um, they, they would have this row of where she would plant her vegetables and um, they, they would get to the beginning of the row and she um, had this water spigot and she would, she had two buckets. One bucket was a bucket that was sealed. It was a good bucket, you know, didn't have any holes in it. But then he, she had another bucket that she would give to her grandson that was cracked and war, you put water in it, water just start leaking automatically. And, and, and he would always get the broken bucket and he didn't understand but you know he was young back then you couldn't say nothing back to your grandparents because it's because I said so and so th she would fill both buckets up and they would walk down the the row and and by the time they got to the end of the row he wouldn't have anything any water left in his bucket but her bucket would still be full and he said what why, why do I have to keep 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 doing this and she would make him do this over and over and over again. And then one day, he got grown enough to say, Grandma, why are you doing this to me? Why are you giving me the, the broken bucket that leaks out everywhere? By the time we get to the end of the road, Grandma, you still have water in your bucket, but mine is empty. And she took him to the, to the end of the row, and she had him look at the row. And she said, Son, what do you see on your side of the row? He said, I see um, some collard greens. I see some onions. I see some watermelon. I see all these fruits and vegetables. What do you see on my side of the row? I just see some grass. She said, I gave you that leaky bucket because while you were walking, you were watering stuff, and it was giving life to stuff such that even though it was broken, It still leaked out life such that stuff around it started to grow. Stuff around it started to have life. Produce and, and, and fruits and vegetables. And I don't know about you, but somebody needs to hear like me that God can use even your broken vessel. Because as you're leaking out, God is saying, I'm going to use that to give life to somebody else. As you're leaking out and stuff is just pouring out and you don't understand why God is using all of that to give life to your families, to give life to your communities, to give life to your culture. God is using all of that. And you need to say to God, what are you doing in my life even in this brokenness? How will you use me even in the midst of my brokenness, God? Let that be your quest. Let that be your quest, that you ask God, God, how are you going to use my brokenness? Because God can do something through your brokenness. We used to sing a song growing up in church. It said, Lord, I'm available to you. My will I give to you. 
I'll do what you say do. Use me, Lord, to show someone the way. Enable me to say my storage, my vessel is empty. But I am available. Anybody in the room available to be used even in your brokenness?